We're going to speak today about uh, current management of diaphragm paralysis. My name is Dr. Matthew Kaufman. Uh, the other speakers will be uh, Dr. Thomas Bauer, who's the chairman of surgery at uh, Jersey Shore University Medical Center, the chief of thoracic surgery at Jersey Shore University Medical Center, and the, an associate professor of surgery at HMH School of Medicine, and Dr. David Brown, who's the outpatient medical director and director of the Electrodiagnostic Laboratory at JFK Johnson Rehabilitation Institute, part of the HMH system in Edison, New Jersey. And I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon and the co-director for the Center for Treatment of Paralysis and Reconstructive Nerve Surgery at Jersey Shore. I also have an appointment at UCLA Medical Center. Before we begin, uh, just a few housekeeping items. Um, in order to receive your CME credits, please make sure you either entered your full name when you logged on, or uh, you can also send a, a through chat your full name, and we will use this to process your CMEs. We do need to acknowledge the uh, fact that we will be recording this uh, talk today, and there will be uh, a link sent out to access it at a later time. Uh, we will be taking questions, but please reserve them till the end. You can enter them in the chat prompt, and we will address them at the end of the talk. Uh, and please kindly mute your audio uh, during the talk to help uh, everyone to hear better. And we'll begin. Um, we have no financial uh, disclosure and disclosures, and as I mentioned, the lecture will be recorded. We know that the phrenic nerve is uniquely suited as the uh, nerve that supplies innervation to the diaphragm on both the right and left sides. It's uh, originating from the cervical root C3, 4, and 5. It also has some sensory components to the pleuropericardium and abdominal components. In the neck area, the phrenic nerve runs in a rather tight space along the anterior scalene muscle and under the prevertebral fascia. It then courses under the subclavian vein and runs in the mediastinum and, and chest down to the diaphragm. The C4 and the C5 are the dominant root innervation to the phrenic nerve. And we'll talk about poorly understood compression and radiculopathy that can be a source of pathology. We see lots of pathology also from intrathoracic injuries, either in the mediastinum, from things like thymectomy, or from cardiac procedures, such as uh, cardiac ablations or cardiac surgery. In the neck, we see compression injuries from things that we call wear and tear, as well as more understandable injuries, such as iatrogenic or tra traumatic causes. In the neck, you can see a tight area of anatomy where the phrenic nerve runs between the scalene muscle, uh, the prevertebral fascia, and some of the crossing vessels off of the thyrocervical trunk. The diaphragm is the primary respiratory muscle. It separates the abdominal and thoracic cavities. And when we breathe in with an inspiratory effort, it contracts and flattens, pushes down the abdominal contents, and allows the lung to have greater domain. Upon expiration, the opposite happens, and the diaphragm moves back into its static position. Uh, we see lots of different etiologies. Uh, in terms of the peripheral etiologies, iatrogenic probably being the most common from surgery in the neck or chest, as mentioned anesthetic blocks, and even chiropractic manipulation. We see acute or chronic trauma from blunt or penetrating injuries, and some of these are more long-term wear and tear type in injuries. And for example, individuals that uh, do heavy lifting or work with their arms over their head. We also see this sort of classic viral neuritis, Parsonage-Turner type syndromes, and uh, other viral causes. We also take care of patients with central nervous system disorders that result in uh, diaphragm dysfunction from primarily spinal cord injury, cord compression, other types of uh, cervical spinal cord injuries, and even stroke. There are also systemic diseases that we see, and obviously these may or may not be amenable to surgery, but things in the central nervous system from uh, MS or stroke, spinal cord injuries uh, related to uh, trauma or other systemic diseases, and then peripheral nerve systemic disorders that can cause unilateral or bilateral phrenic nerve weakness. We also occasionally see muscular disorders from systemic disease such as muscular dystrophy and uh, 
myasthenia gravis. The typical iatrogenic injuries are uh, scalene blocks from shoulder surgery, chiropractic manipulation of the neck, cardiac surgery procedures, and even cardiac ablation. And where we'll talk about our approaches and, and treatment and protocols for these types of injuries. There's also a phenomenon that we talk about in the world of peripheral nerve surgery called double crush, which was described in 1973. And it's very applicable to simple, more simple things like carpal tunnel. But basically, if a nerve is impaired at one location, it makes it more susceptible to entrapments in other areas along the same neural pathway. So, for example, if a patient has a cervical spine degeneration or disc herniation, it takes less injury to the nerve itself. So, in the example of the phrenic nerve, less direct injury to the phrenic nerve before there would be diaphragm dysfunction. Our pre-surgical evaluation is comprehensive. We treat symptomatic patients. We all know that there are cases where diaphragm dysfunction can be well tolerated, but we're treating patients that have symptoms, primarily exertional dyspnea, positional dyspnea or orthopnea, easy fatigability. Recurrent pneumonias is something we see often, and, and even more common is sleep disordered breathing. Uh, evaluation involves chest fluoroscopy or sniff testing, pulmonary function testing. We do in-office maximal inspiratory pressure or MIP testing, electrodiagnostics, and uh, imaging as needed of both the neck, chest, and spinal cord. The symptoms we see, sleep disorder breathing, very common. Many patients are on uh, mask uh, ventilation systems or need to be, and their, their sleep studies uh, are in accordance with uh, a, a version of sleep disorder breathing from the diaphragm paralysis. They may not have had pre-existing sleep apnea. Positional dyspnea patients often say they have difficulty tying their shoes and obviously exertion. The long-term consequences are exercise intolerance, sleep disturbances uh, that require some type of uh, intervention, weight gain, reduced quality of life, susceptibility to infections or other pulmonary disorders, depression, and even sexual dysfunction. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brown now, who will talk about our electrodiagnostic evaluations that go into uh, patient workup. Yes, uh, yes, good morning. Unfortunately, I lost my uh, video feed, but Matt, if you can just uh, advance the slides for me. I think we can do this. Sure. So the overview is I'm going to talk a little bit about neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, and classification of nerve injury as it applies to the electrodiagnostic techniques, and talk a little bit about ultrasound of the diaphragm. Uh, next slide, please. And I think we're on the diagnostic slide. Confirm with as Dr. Kaufman was saying, fluoroscopy, chest radiography, uh, sometimes chest CT scan, pulmonary function test, but the phrenic nerve conduction studies and diaphragm EMGs are actually functional studies of the uh, neuromuscular pathway, and we find them to be very valuable in helping to evaluate the function of the neuromuscular system and also the viability uh, for that system for repair. Ultrasound of the diaphragm is useful to help with evaluating diaphragm function. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, phrenic nerve is a large myelinated nerve, thematic and fast, and it's capable of being studied with uh, standard EMG NCV studies. Uh, next slide. The large myelinated nerve consists of the cell body, which is the axon, which extends peripherally. And then the satellite cells, the swan cells, which are multi-layered proteolipids on myelin, acts as the insulator. And next slide, please. This is a screenshot of the peripheral nerve. Shows the axon with the myelin sheath, the endoneurium, and then bundles of axons surrounded by the perineurium, and then the epineurium, which uh, surrounds the entire nerve, provides uh, strength to the nerve against crush and stretch injuries. Significantly, if the epineurium is in place in the event of axon damage, the axon has the potential to grow back spontaneously in the periphery, and that's at a rate of about a millimeter a day or about an inch a month. 
The next slide, please. So the neuroanatomy of the motor unit consists of uh, the basic functional element uh, of the neuromuscular system. That consists of the anterior horn cell or the motor nucleus, the motor axon, the neuromuscular junction, and all the muscle fibers that it innervates. Uh, next slide, please. So the neuroanatomy here, the motor unit, uh, this is a screenshot through the cervical uh, spine area, but it applies to the diaphragm and the phrenic nerve as well. So uh, this system can have uh, disruptions in any segment. Uh, number one would be the motor nucleus or the anterior horn cell. And think of things such as uh, ALS and motor neuron disease or polio. And the nerve itself can be traumatized, but it's also susceptible to various entities, drugs, alcohol, gabaglobinemias, toxins, heritable disorders, endocrinopathies such as diabetes, thyroid disease, uh, also in uremia, uh, autoimmune processes, uh, infections, including idiopathic neuritis, and also perineoplastic syndrome. And down at the neuromuscular junction, as Dr. Kaufman was saying, uh, myasthenia gravis can interfere with uh, neuromuscular transmission to the muscle fibers, myasthenic syndrome, and I've seen a number of infants with botulism poisoning, uh, which causes paralysis at this level. And then finally, at the muscle level, uh, there are congenital and acquired myopathies, which can cause dysfunction in the system. Next slide, please. So the nerve's electrical activity is key to functional analysis. You can stimulate the nerve artificially, measure the velocity, uh, and also measure the amplitude or magnitude of response. Next slide, please. And the muscle can be evaluated then for its electrical characteristics with a needle electrode to look at recruitment, membrane stability, and also uh, the health of the muscle through uh, motor unit analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So in the classification of nerve injury, if there's myelin damage, this can lead to conduction block or slowing. The classic case is in Guillain-Barre or um, acute um, inflammatory peripheral polyneuropathy. Remyelination is possible with complete or incomplete uh, return to normal transmission. Next slide, please. Axonal injuries can be caused by focal crush, stretch, transaction, peripheral neuropathy. And if the uh, axon is severed completely, then there's a disruption of axon plasmic flow, and then the nerve dies, the axon dies. Next slide, please. At that point, then, there's Wallerian degeneration from the point of injury distally. And in motor nerves, this will be complete in about seven days. The nerve digests itself, basically. Sensory nerves, a little longer. Next slide, please. So the value of uh, the electrodiagnostics, then, is we can quantify the degree of phrenic nerve dysfunction by measuring conduction delay, axonal loss, and the quality of motor activity within the diaphragm muscle itself. Next slide, please. And so we can stimulate the uh, phrenic nerve in the neck, usually posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Uh, we generate enough charge with a stimulator that a threshold is reached, and then the nerve propagates its own discharge uh, through saltatory conduction from notobron VA to notobron VA down to the diaphragm, and we'll get a muscle contraction. Next slide, slide please. And so this is just showing uh, the normal setup for this particular study, stimulating at the neck, picking up, up over the anterior chest wall leads. Uh, technical difficulties arise with patients with high, with high, high BMI. High BMI. And, and uh, uh, so the, so the simulator, simulator charge may, charge may be quite high, be in, quite order high in order to get complete discharge of the nerve. Pickup over the uh, anterior chest wall can be a problem also in patients with high BMI. 
uh, due to the fact that the surface electrode can be quite a distance from the discharging diaphragm, making the amplitude quite variable. Next slide, please. And this is a uh, screenshot of the patient's normal side. Uh, the discharge occurs, and then uh, nine milliseconds later, there is the initiation of the phrenic uh, nerve and uh, diaphragm action potential. And this will vary in time depending upon the health of the myelin, but also the uh, height of the individual. Usually this comes in at about 8 to 11 milliseconds. The amplitude here is 0 0.200 millivolts, and this is quite normal. And this can vary quite widely. Uh, we've seen in our series of patients from, say, 0.125 millivolts up to 0 0.550 millivolts. Next slide, please. And this is the side that's the affected side. And you'll notice that the um, latency, the time of discharge is almost double. And that the amplitude of response is about 30% compared to the normal side. So obviously there's axonal damage going on, loss of fast uh, axons and some demyelination as well. Next slide, please. So we use the ultrasound now. It helps uh, with accurate needle placement when we're going to um, assess the diaphragm, but it also allows us to have direct view of the diaphragm to assess its appearance and its motion. Next time, uh, slide, please. And so here the transducer is placed anterior axillary line uh, over the eighth rib. Uh, next slide, please. And here you see two screenshots. And this is looking, the AA uh, letters designate the diaphragm. And on the normal side, we've seen that um, thickness of the diaphragm usually be between 0 0.19 and 0 0.23 uh, millimeters. And this is taken, this measure is taken at the end of expiration when the diaphragm is relaxed. On the affected side, uh, the diaphragm tends to atrophy fairly quickly. And it'll usually be around 0 0.9 to 0 0.1 centimeters, about half the normal thickness compared to the healthy side. Uh, next diagram, please. So what this represents is a monopolar needle placement uh, into the diaphragm. And this is done over the eighth rib, anterior axillary line, through the skin, through the fat, through the intercostal muscles, and then down to the diaphragm. And next slide, please. And this shows a screen representation of the motor units in this particular patient's uh, diaphragm. And what we're seeing here is very discrete uh, motor unit activity. So there's uh, two, maybe three motor units firing in this patient's uh, diaphragm. The normal would fill the screen. So putting all of this data together, we have a patient with a incomplete uh, phrenic neuropathy uh, showing axonal uh, characteristics. Uh, next slide. Uh, protocol that we use here in the office includes, of course, taking the history, doing, auscultating the uh, uh, lungs, doing a strength, a reflex, sensory examination, and then doing um, motor and sensory of the bilateral median and all their nerves. We're looking for a generalized peripheral neuropathy to put in context with the focal neuropathy of the, di of the phrenic nerves. And then we also do EMG of the selected uh, C5 through T1 muscles and the cervical paraspinal is looking for a concomitant uh, brachial plexopathy, cervical radiculopathies. And final slide. Uh, this is the protocol we've been using for the last 360 or so patients, and we feel that this gives us a very strong data point in order to uh, clarify uh, the type and quality of the phrenic neuropathies. Dr. Kaufman, back to you. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> so moving on to uh, treatment options. Uh, we know that there are non-surgical options for diaphragm paralysis, medication, which is rather ineffective, ineffective rather, and uh, 
pulmonary rehab and diaphragm PT, which is an important part of either our preoperative uh, assessment and certainly in the post-surgical uh, rehabilitation phase. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. As mentioned previously, a CPAP and BiPAP are found to be very uh, helpful and uh, of great utility for the sleep disordered breathing that can be concomitant with the diaphragmatic paralysis, as mentioned, even in patients that don't have pre-existing sleep apnea. As far as the surgical treatment, we're going to cover each of these diaphragm plication, phrenic nerve reconstruction, and diaphragm pacemakers. Our center, and including the speakers today, are part of a multidisciplinary program, and we see and evaluate uh, uh, thousands of patients over the last 10 or 11 years uh, and have treated over 500. So a, gr a great experience and an ability to use each of these treatments uh, in an effective and algorithmic way, which we'll cover. We've also published this algorithm, which I'm not going to go into too much detail, and we'll, we'll, we'll speak about it again at the end, but basically use all of these different modalities, including some of the non-surgical modalities, to best, best treat these patients, provide optimal care, and based upon extensive workup, including the electrodiagnostics, which are so valuable, to provide what we believe and what we published as well uh, to be the, the best uh, and overall uh, optimal care of these patients. So I'm, gonna, I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Bauer, who will speak about diaphragm plication. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, and uh, as I'm getting started, uh, Dr. Kaufman pointed this out, and I just want to underscore that uh, I think what makes the program uh, successful that we have is the fact that it's multidisciplinary. And so we're frequently on the phone reviewing films, uh, scenarios, or having patients fly in and see both of us, uh, and then go up and, and see Dr. Brown. So it, it it's putting everybody's expertise together that enables us to be successful. Uh, as uh, Dr. Kaufman pointed out early, the, the phrenic nerve, uh, it, it amazes me that it's not injured more frequently. Um, uh, th this is a patient with a thymic tumor that is very close to the phrenic nerve. The internal mammary artery, which is harvested for a lot of uh, cardiac operations, is again, uh, uh, runs right underneath the phrenic nerve, high up where it's uh, mobilized. And then uh, ablation procedures, The uh, just below where I have the SVC outlined are the pulmonary veins. And when they're doing cardiac ablation, uh, they're uh, right beside the uh, phrenic nerve. And if there's full thickness burn, uh, that ends up uh, injuring the nerve as well. Next slide, please. Um, so, <clears throat> a, a majority of our patients, are, or almost all, are evaluated uh, in a multidisciplinary fashion, and we reserve uh, VATS or thoracoscopy for those patients that are deemed not to be uh, a candidate. And as Dr. Kaufman goes through his algorithm, it will be obvious which those patients are. Um, traditionally, it was done in, as an open technique, it'd be a a normal uh, large posterior lateral thoracotomy, and that is still the uh, treatment of choice in most uh, centers. Uh, but with our experience doing minimally invasive uh, uh, surgery and doing an extensive amount of it, doing this as a VATS approach uh, it actually provides superior uh, view uh, and uh, technical ability over a thoracotomy. And, uh, enables us to do it with three small incisions. It takes about 45 minutes to do the procedure. Uh, we've done it robotically as well as a standard um, uh, VATS. The, the benefit of the VATS, in my opinion, is I'm just doing uh, two 10 millimeter incisions and one five millimeter incision with the robot. I'm typically making a few more incisions, uh, which adds to a little bit more discomfort but provides no benefit. So they're all done without the robot uh, at this point. Um, patients are typically able to go home the day after surgery. For those patients that are flying 
uh, from various parts of the country. They usually fly in the day before surgery. Uh, we'll spend two days in the hospital. We we'll spend an additional day or two in the area, uh, be seen again in the office, and then be able to fly home in less than a week. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Kaufman's already reviewed this, but the the benefit of application is it's restoring the diaphragm to a lower level. This is especially problematic when patients lie fat, flat, and the majority of the patients we're doing placations on uh, tend to be the older population, tend to be more symptomatic, and tend toward uh, being slightly overweight. And uh, the comorbidities worsen their, uh, make their symptoms more significant. And the added weight on uh, in the abdomen when they lay flat pushes the diaphragm further up. So the the uh, primary focus of the application is to uh, lower the diaphragm to as normal a location as possible on, on full inspiration, and then allow the accessory muscles to be able to increase the volume and uh, uh, improve airflow. And it minimizes the upward excursion of the diaphragm uh, when they're lying flat or, or bending over, and our, our patients have a significant improvement in their symptomatic relief as a result of this operation. Next slide, please. The, these are just examples on the uh, right. You see an elevated diaphragm over the liver, uh, and the uh, slide on uh, your screen left is a post-op. So by tailoring how we do the plication, we're able to recon reconstruct the costophrenic uh, angle and lower the diaphragm. It, it should be mentioned that doing the right side, it's harder because you're having to push the liver down. Uh, and when they're obese, if you have any loss of domain in the abdomen, that's typically what is limiting our ability to lower the diaphragm. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so the, the way that this is done is with uh, uh, an instrument called an endo stitch, but basically it's pictured, it shuttles the needle back and forth. And so we uh, go typically medial to lateral, and uh, the medial uh, plications are usually two or three uh, sutures that are then tied. And as you get to the middle, you're able to plicate more. Uh, but the uh, plication sutures are bringing it in two different directions. It's bringing the rows of sutures together, which shortens the diaphragm from medial to lateral, and by running them in a typical anterior to posterior fashion, it shortens it in that direction as well. And then as you get more laterally, you're taking less uh, sutures and bringing less tissue together to affect a more normal curvature of the uh, diaphragm. No, next slide, please. So the benefits, uh, it provides an immediate improvement in their intrathoracic volume. And so our patients tend to be older and more symptomatic uh, that need an immediate uh, improvement. Uh, it's done uh, in a minimally invasive approach. The, the one thoracotomy I've had to do was in a patient who had uh, uh, a diaphragmatic uh, and chest wall resection as part of a cancer operation in his abdomen uh, and had a paralyzed diaphragm and uh, afterwards had significant elevation of it. And so to uh, free up everything and uh, improve uh, his outcome was done open, but all of the other ones have been done minimally invasively. And all of our patients have had an improvement in their ability to lie flat, uh, bend over, uh, and their exercise tolerance uh, is improved from a symptomatic uh, standpoint. And I've already mentioned their uh, length of stay. Next slide, please. The, the limitations are in the more obese patients, uh, we simply can't push the diaphragm down far enough to affect a significant improvement. It is more challenging on the uh, right side, as I mentioned. Uh, we've had two patients that uh, had a recurrence at a couple months. Uh, one that comes to mind was a woman who was in her 60s, lived on a farm in West Virginia, and uh, took care of herself in the farm. 
and she called me uh, three months uh, post-op saying uh, you know, I was uh, throwing fertilizer bags around and they weigh 100 pounds and I felt a pop and the next day I felt two more pops and then I was short of breath again. And so we've really attempted to encourage our patients to avoid heavy lifting because when you're bending over, it increases intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, and then when you're lifting at the same time, it dramatically puts uh, more pressure on the diaphragm and can uh, pop the stitches. Uh, but with the exception of that, uh, the recurrence rate is very low, uh, the volume is improved, and the paradoxical motion that you can get uh, is eliminated. Uh, however, the limitation is it is not normal function. It's just trying to increase the intrathoracic space. Next slide. Thanks, Dr. Bauer. So we'll move on and speak about phrenic nerve reconstruction as an expand as an expanded option for treatment of, of symptomatic diaphragm paralysis. The rationale for phrenic nerve reconstruction goes back to the development of peripheral nerve microsurgery techniques that have demonstrated efficacy for 50 years. We use them in all kinds of peripheral nerve injuries throughout the body, facial nerve, arm paralysis, leg paralysis, brachial plexus injuries, and the like. The, uh, the principle of uh, functional restoration of muscular paralysis being preferable to static correction when feasible. The analogy being if someone has a foot drop due to a perineal nerve injury, the first attempt would be to fix the perineal nerve and not, and not create an ankle fusion. And so when we look at different areas of the body and muscular paralysis, can we restore function to that muscle? We know that phrenic nerve injury is the most likely cause of diaphragm paralysis, so most of the patients that present have a phrenic nerve injury, and if we can evaluate it properly and determine if we can use these techniques, there's a role for this surgery. And also, until recently, it's very likely that many cases or most cases of diaphragm paralysis probably go untreated. We're using three basic techniques in nerve reconstruction, one being neurolysis or nerve decompression. Nerve decompression is removing impingement or, or scar tissue or adhesions from a nerve. The second being interposition grafting, which also goes by the, the terms autograft or transplanting and nerve bypassing. So if there's damage to a segment of the nerve, we can take a nerve graft and splice it in to bypass the injury. And the third being nerve transfer and neurotization which is using a, a, a spare part donor nerve to power the phrenic nerve. And I'll show you examples. Here's an example of phrenic nerve decompression. On screen left, you can see uh, a casing around the phrenic nerve, which is white in, in color. And when that, enough of that casing is present and starts to compress, it can lead to a, a, a reduction in the impulse uh, conduction or the impulse flow. And so we go in and we're relieving that, that casing, we're relieving that fibrosis. And that can often be from thickened fascia or from adherent uh, scalene muscle. Here's another example of vascular compression. We know that nerves can be compressed by adherent vasculature. And so when, there's, when there are inflammatory changes in the neck from trauma or injury, the blood vessels that are normally in that anatomical location now become uh, compressive. Or strangulating to the nerve and so but we sometimes have to go in and release the vasculature. Uh, these are additional adhesions you can see on the top left there's this sort of band of yellowish reddish tissue that's uh, squeezing the nerve or compressing the nerve and we're trying to do a dissection that essentially makes the nerve look like an anatomy dissection to create a space to relieve the pressure. We also use prevention measures after the surgery to prevent future scar. We know surgery can create scar, so we use these collagen nerve wraps, which act as insulators to the nerve after we've done our decompression. We perform nerve bypass or interposition grafting in almost all cases. So you can see in this diagram, when there's an injured nerve where the axons themselves may be damaged, and so just cleaning out the outside or just doing a decompression may not be enough where we can take uh, a nerve graft and plug it in to the intervening segment. Here's an example of a phrenic nerve. You can see the narrowing on the left. It almost looks like a sausage link, where that's from a, that was actually a patient who had chiropractic manipulation that we, that we presume led to some twisting of the nerve. 
and some compression that led to uh, a, a narrowing in this mid segment. And we're, we're using on the right, you can see a nerve graft where we're sewing in above and below the damaged area. We also do nerve transfers, which are basically, basically taking a, a, a nerve, uh, a different nerve, uh, either in the neck or chest area, sometimes the spinal accessory being a donor, and we can plug it into the phrenic. We don't sacrifice the spinal accessory nerve, rather we dissect out the two terminal branches. Here's an example of using the spinal accessory nerve to power the phrenic nerve. We've dissected out the phrenic nerve. Um, so this, the spinal accessory is, is the one on the left and the phrenic nerve is the one on the right. And here you can see a connection between the spinal accessory nerve and the phrenic nerve that's basically over time going to regrow at that one millimeter a day and allow over time the uh, impulses from the spinal accessory nerve branch to power the phrenic nerve and lead to imp improved impulse in the diaphragm. In the 80s and 90s, there were scattered reports about phrenic nerve reconstruction from the pediatric surgery literature and from acute trauma. Our, our experience began in 2007 and has uh, continued and expanded until current times. We've evaluated thousands of patients. We've treated more than at least 500 uh, with phrenic nerve reconstruction, not to mention other modalities. And we, and we have two national referral centers, uh, primarily in New Jersey, and we've developed one out at UCLA Medical Center. As I mentioned, it's a multidisciplinary uh, approach and multimodality approach. And we believe that given the uh, sort of orphan condition of diaphragm paralysis, this type of condition is better treated at uh, specialty centers that have lots of experience. We've published extensively since 2011 uh, to, to, to demonstrate our outcomes and also to look at particulars of the pathology. We've also uh, written chapters in textbooks. Uh, we have a section in uptodate.com on surgical treatment of phrenic nerve injury, and we've uh, written several chapters in thoracic uh, publications. Our first report was in 2011 in CHEST, looking at the feasibility in 12 patients, where we demonstrated that 89% of those patients improved based upon outcome measures, pulmonary function, sniff testing, and physical functioning surveys, basically exercise tolerance. We had a follow-up study in 2014, which was a cohort study in annals of thoracic surgery. We compared phrenic nerve reconstruction to non-surgical care, which was our control group, and a historical cohort of patients that had received diaphragm plication, hoping to add phrenic nerve reconstruction to the standard treatment algorithm. The inclusion criteria for phrenic nerve surgery, phrenic nerve reconstruction was symptomatic patients for greater than eight months who had abnormalities on testing and had an absence of evidence of either systemic disease or organic pathology. We matched 68 patients undergoing phrenic nerve reconstruction to a non-surgical control and 68 patients that were identified in a PRISMA meta-analysis who had diaphragm plication. They were matched for age, sex, BMIs, and other factors. Of note, in the phrenic nerve reconstruction a group, our follow-up was only one year, so a rather short time when looking at a neuromuscular reconstruction. We did, however, show and demonstrate an increase in uh, spirometry values, significant, whereas the non control uh, had no change. We showed improvements in uh, FEV1 and FEC, and this is the FEV1 graph showing that the phrenic nerve surgery and diaphragm plication groups improved. There was a slight trend that the plication had greater improvement at, uh, when we looked at our phrenic nerve surgery group at one year, and the non-surgical group had no change. Same for the FVC. This was our survey reporting uh, that showed uh, significant in improvements in quality of life, physical functioning compared to non-surgical care. We had significant improvements in our electrodiagnostics. So we had deficits in preoperative uh, motor amplitudes and in uh, nerve conduction. 
and we demonstrated that our motor amplitudes improved by 37 percent, our nerve conduction latency improved by 69 percent. This was significant. And here's our uh, follow-up uh, pre and post x-rays showing that the diaphragm, when it regained tone from phrenic nerve reconstruction, allowed the diaphragm to move down and allowed the lung to have more volume. This in a 65-year-old female. This is a 33-year-old male who had iatrogenic injury from prior long thoracic nerve release. And this was a 34-year-old male with, uh, who had a traumatic injury. So in conclusion, we showed a clear benefit of phrenic nerve reconstruction versus no treatment. The spirometry results were uh, slightly better in the plication group, but statistically equivalent at one year follow-up. And uh, we had demonstrable improvements in ledger diagnostics with a consideration to amend the standard treatment algorithm. We wondered what would happen if we followed our phrenic nerve reconstruction patients longer than one year, because knowing that muscles take a long time to recover after re -innervation. So we looked at 180 patients a few years later, and a mean follow-up of 2.7 years. Uh, our demographics, more males than females, uh, greater right side than left side, and most of these were atrogenic injuries followed by trauma. Most of the approaches were cervical. Some of these were intrathoracic approaches. Mean operative time, three, three hours, and mean length of stay, just over one day, with a low complication rate. We demonstrated uh, progressive improvements in our pulmonary function testing between pre- and post-op in all standard parameters. We also, again, showed improvements in nerve activity or nerve conduction latencies. After two years, we, we demonstrated what we hoped we would see, which is a, a much greater improvement in, in muscle strength or motor amplitudes, which had increased now by 125%. And again, improvements in physical functioning at two and a half years. So what we demonstrated is longer follow-up leads to progressive improvement in spirometry values and that it leads to uh, also progressive improvement in overall diaphragm function. This year, we submitted our 400 case series, which represents the largest worldwide experience, the largest database of patients with diaphragm paralysis. Again, our demographics, mean age in the mid-50s, ranging from 19 to 79, uh, more males and females, I mean BMI of 30, and uh, more, more right-sided injuries. Average duration of paralysis was 29 months. And again, acute or tr chronic trauma and uh, iatrogenic injuries representing the greatest percentage. We started uh, including now patients that had idiopathic paralysis or Parsonage Turner, where in the past we may have not included them, but because we now understood the pathology better and really believe that many of these idiopathic cases are actually compression wear and tear type of injuries, that as long as we rule out systemic disease, we often can uh, include these patients in uh, treatment with uh, nerve reconstruction as an option. And here's what we were able to demonstrate, that between post-op year one and post-op year two, we are seeing a stepwise increase in our spirometry values. Again, this goes back to the need for greater time for recovery. So the surgery is creating improvement in nerve conduction, but it's not, it's not creating a strong diaphragm. So we've instituted a much more rigorous post-operative rehabilitation course so that once we demonstrate electrical recovery, we know the patients have to work to strengthen the diaphragm through post-operative diaphragm, physical therapy, and conditioning means. And we're able to show that this improvement goes on and on, particularly at the, between the one and two year mark. We uh, demonstrated improvements in uh, MIP values or maximal inspiratory pressure that were approaching normal. This was at about a year. This is when we started uh, including this testing parameter, which I think is a, an important uh, parameter for measuring inspiratory strength, whereas most of the other spirometry values are done on exhalation. Diaphragm EMG, approaching normal values, that's the motor amplitude or muscle strength. And we uh, also included now ultrasound measurements of resting diaphragm thickness, as, uh, as Dr. Brown mentioned, as a, a way to determine muscle bulk, which would indicate muscle recovery. So our duration of surgery overall is three hours. 
on average. Length of stay for transcervical approach is one day, sometimes outpatient. Uh, intrathoracic surgery is three days, similar to the plication. Uh, complications are uh, seroma, 5%, and wound infection, hematoma, pleural fusion, 1%. Of note, when we do our intrathoracic repairs, it's, it is done through a, a, minim, uh, a minim, minimal uh, thoracotomy, small thoracotomy, sometimes VATS assisted. And going back to our algorithm, so now we can include all these modalities. We're going to talk in a moment about pacemakers and where that fits in. But what we do know is uh, that when we utilize our electrodiagnostics, when we talk about uh, possible mechanisms of injury and whether patients have early benefit from diaphragm physical therapy or not, we can stratify them to either a supportive care, phrenic nerve reconstruction, if feasible, and diaphragm plication. We do reserve uh, plication for also for failed phrenic nerve reconstruction. So if a patient has is is a candidate for phrenic nerve reconstruction and ultimately is a failure, they can still have plication. Whereas we're not so sure that if a plication fails, that we can go back and do nerve reconstruction. So moving on to bilateral diaphragm paralysis, which is a, a rather unique presentation. Usually we're seeing unilateral, and on occasion we do see bilateral. Uh, we think it's related to cervical stenosis or bilateral phrenic nerve compression. We obviously have to rule out systemic neurodegenerative disease in this case. And they present with much more significant symptoms, really oxygen and, and BiPAP dependence, sometimes non-invasive ventilator dependency using a trilogy or other non-invasive ventilator. They have, on average, resting and exertional dyspnea, and their physical function is severely limited. We've developed a protocol for these patients that's multimodality, multidisciplinary, using phrenic nerve reconstruction on the more severely impacted side, as long as it's feasible, as well as and simultaneous with laparoscopic implantation of a pacemaker, which is uh, performed by Dr. Bauer. Uh, Twelve months later, uh, we'll go back and, and if, if it's indicated, we'll reconstruct the contralateral phrenic nerve. And then in the third stage, we will explant the pacemaker once we've deemed that re, uh, reinnervation and regeneration has occurred. So we, uh, we've reported on 14 patients that had, this, uh, that had bilateral diaphragm uh, dysfunction using this multimodality uh, treatment protocol. We just submitted it to the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery, and uh, we looked at our outcomes. We also compared the side-to-side uh, -side differences at a year, so the side that was receiving both nerve reconstruction and pacemaker versus pacemaker alone. There were significant deficits in our motor amplitude, so the top row, the ultrasound thickness of the diaphragm, and our MIP studies and pulmonary function values. So the, the, the values, the baseline values in these bilateral patients were much more significant and much more uh, troubling than in our unilateral uh, cohort. And what we're able to demonstrate is that uh, using this multimodality approach that uh, we were able to show MIP values that improved really into the normal range, diaphragm EMG that had significant improvement, the so motor amplitudes improved by quite a lot, uh, ultrasound measurements of resting diaphragm thickness also improved into normal range, pulmonary function with significant improvements in FEV1 and FEC. And um, overall, you know, that uh, we can treat these bilateral patients and bring them back to a functional status using both uh, pacemakers and nerve surgery. The pay pacemakers play a vital role in these bilateral patients uh, for, for various reasons. One is to make the anesthetic event itself safer by supercharging the diaphragms to get them out of anesthesia to prevent the uh, contralateral side from having uh, a continued atrophy and to promote regeneration. We also showed that on the side that was uh, receiving both the nerve reconstruction plus pacemaker, there were uh, uh, improvements greater than uh, with pacemaker alone. So the nerve surgery does play a significant role. Moving on to pacemakers, uh, we know the indications, the standard indications are for cervical spinal cord injury, 
sleep apnea, and uh, now some controversy over whether ALS patients are candidates. We also have applied them, as just mentioned, for bilateral diaphragm dysfunction, and we also use them uh, for complex unilateral cases where there might be an old injury, a hostile surgical field, or patients that are unable to participate in diaphragm PT, maybe because they have bad knees or they're overweight and that the bottom two categories would be off-label uses of this diaphragm pacemaker. One of the misconceptions that we, uh, that we hear all the time uh, is that we can implant pacemakers in patients that have phrenic nerve injury or unilateral paralysis as a standalone option. And although there have been some studies, if there is no phrenic nerve stimulation, the pacemaker will not be effective. You need to have a stimulatable phrenic nerve for the pacemaker to work. Otherwise, you need to combine modalities. There are different uh, pacemakers available in the U.S. that are, F that are approved, FDA approved. This is one that's implanted through the cervical region, or it can be implanted around the phrenic nerve in the chest cavity, but basically a fully implantable receiver and electrode with an external transmitter. Uh, we place this transcervically. You can see here an intraoperative view of a pacemaker being placed with the electrode around the phrenic nerve through an incision in the neck. Those other two incisions are chest incisions for the receiver. You can see the receiver on the chest wall on the left side and then on the right, the white antenna that's placed over the skin that stimulates transcutaneously. The other device is our laparoscopic implantation device uh, that's performed by Dr. Bauer. There are uh, electrodes that are placed at the nerve muscle interface. This is a, a view from, uh, from a laparoscopic abdominal approach looking up at the diaphragm and a trocar placing electrodes at the nerve muscle interface. And that's done through uh, nerve mapping to determine location. This is the external view of the uh, transmitter connected to the externalized port. And this is our experience in looking at uh, patients that require nerve reconstruction with pacemakers. So as I mentioned, in patients that have non-stimulatable phrenic nerves, in order to have an effective pacing situation, we first need to reconstruct the phrenic nerve. And this applies to maybe 20 to 25 percent of cervical spinal cord patients. So we published our early experience, 2010 to 2015, with 14 patients with high cervical tetraplegia who had previously failed, uh, many of whom had previously failed pacemaker attempts, and we were treating these patients 34 months post-injury, which is a long period of time, a long delay. We included patients with cervical tetraplegia who are chronically ventilator dependent, with no active respiratory infection, adequate cognitive function, and appropriate care support. We placed the, uh, the device and did our nerve reconstruction either through cervical or intrathoracic approaches, with intraoperative nerve testing, nerve grafting, and the pacemaker approach. This is an intraoperative intrathoracic view where uh, difficult to make out, but basically an electrode placed around the phrenic nerve in the chest cavity with an intercostal graft that's mobilized and transferred and hooked up to the phrenic nerve all through an intrathoracic approach. In this series, we demonstrated through electrical testing, electrodiagnostic testing, a 93% successful re um, outcome. Uh, the time from surgery to re on average was about seven months. However, 62% uh, achieved sustainable pacing, meaning more than an hour a day. Two patients did recover spontaneous respiratory activity, meaning the nerve reconstruction led to spontaneous improvement. And we, uh, we, did, we were able to achieve a 20% reduction in overall vent dependency. The limitation really was the overall outcome in sustainable pacing, we attribute at least in part to a, a almost a three-year delay in getting to these patients with, with a substantial atrophy and neural degeneration. Here's one patient that recovered electrical activity. You can see here on the left, the standard blip of the pacemaker and now the activity of the diaphragm activity of the diaphragm function on the right side nine, month, nine months out. So we know ben the benefits of weaning off a of ventilator are dramatic in terms of morbidity and mortality, and uh, we've developed a, an, a treatment algorithm for these spinal cord patients that includes adding phrenic nerve reconstruction when necessary. Timing is absolutely critical. 
We submitted and were uh, accepted to Journal of Spinal Cord Medicine with an updated series in 2020. Um, in 10 patients treated between 2015 and 2019, all with cervical spinal cord injury, all completely ventilator dependent with a newly developed surgical algorithm. Some patients just require pacemakers. If they have stimulatable phrenic nerves, they do not need phrenic nerve reconstruction. The group two would be pacemaker plus phrenic nerve reconstruction when, when the phrenic nerves are non-stimulatable on one or both sides. And now we've developed a new treatment for long-standing spinal cord injury where there's been substantial or near complete um, muscular denervation atrophy or loss of the potential to restore function to the diaphragm where we can actually use innervated vascularized muscle using the rectus muscle as a neo diaphragm. Um, they were all high cervical tetraplegics, all um, had complete uh, spinal cord injury, and at least half of them had attempts at prior pacing. The last column, prior PA, were patients that had undergone prior pacemaker attempts and were told basically that uh, nothing could be done. So uh, patient one, patient two, all the yeses, all the whys were patients that had prior pacemaker attempts. The second to last column is the duration between injury and surgery. And in this, uh, in this cohort, we we're able to get to these patients at an earlier time, apart from patient 10, which was two years. Everybody was under, uh, I'm sorry, it was four years. Uh, everybody was within two or three years of, uh, of, of the injury. Um, several of the patients had intrathoracic repairs and a few were just cervical repairs. Um, again, treatment one was pacemaker alone. So in patient six and patient nine, Group two was pacemaker plus phrenic nerve reconstruction, and group three, we had two patients, patient one and patient 10, who underwent uh, pacemaker placement plus diaphragm muscle replacement surgery. And the second to last column was the, uh, the decrease, uh, the time from uh, surgery to the reduction in ventilator um, requirements. So in eight of 10 patients, we achieved partial or complete weaning. Partial would be at least one hour a day completely off of the vent, and, and complete weaning would be greater than 12 hours a day or the ability for essentially 24 hours a day off the vent. Of the seven patients that initially failed pacemaker attempts elsewhere and were told that they would never wean, five have achieved partial or complete weaning. Uh, we, we feel that with this algorithm, it may provide an opportunity for uh, just about all ventilator-dependent spinal cord patients to have a chance to wean. And we know, again, that timing is critical, uh, less than one to two years post-injury. So uh, take-home points from the lecture. A phrenic nerve reconstruction has been demonstrated as a safe, effective treatment for diaphragm paralysis, for restoring functional activity, and expanding standard treatment options. Uh, we feel that, that this condition is an orphaned um, disease, an orphaned condition, which may, may be better managed and experienced multidisciplinary centers. We promote the use of all modalities applied in a systematic manner using a surgical treatment algorithm to achieve optimal outcomes. Thank you very much. We'll take uh, questions. Let's see if we can pull up the... Uh, pull up the... Um, chat now. So we'll, st we'll just start going down and uh, Tom and, and uh, Dave can chime in. The first question I see here is um, I have a Guillain-Barre patient that I believe probably has bilateral paralysis. He had cervical neck surgery a year ago and has been slowly decompensating ever since. Non-invasive vent dependent, morbid obesity, now almost bedridden. Um, how should we go into the uh, workup for this patient? And uh, this, the, the person who wrote the question is his home care uh, RRT who oversees his trilogy use. Um, well, I think first and uh, first off is uh, his his treatment options would obviously be limited if he's bedridden and morbidly obese. Um, 
I'll defer to the group, but I think, uh, you know, work up if possible to determine if indeed it is Guillain-Barre and whether there are motor units available and uh, perhaps the only option that would be likely would, uh, or even feasible would be a pacemaker uh, placement either laparoscopically or, or cervically in the neck, but it would really depend on the on the workup and the status of his uh, neuromuscular function. Tom, any role for uh, plication no, here? No, I, I, I agree with you that I think, you know, if he had some function, uh, that you might be able to improve it, uh, as you pointed out, but, but Application would not likely benefit him. Yeah. Let's see. I just scroll down. Uh, okay. Let's see here. You see the next? Oh, here it is. Well, sir, and then the, to follow up is that he also is in great need of more aggressive airway clearance. I mean, I guess, uh, obviously, you look at uh, more aggressive pulmonary toilet and a vest, as you mentioned, um, obviously a tracheostomy in worst, worst case uh, scenario. That was, do you see any other questions? I only see that one. No, and the, the, the other point that I would make, Dr. Kaufman, is I think the, the pulmonologists that have a keen awareness of this and look for it, uh, the more you look for it, the more you find it. And what we've seen uh, from patients that are coming to us from uh, all over is, uh, and there was one written up in Reader's Digest uh, for an individual from, um, I think it was Tennessee, um, that uh, these people are seen as uh, their comorbidities, their heart, their slate obesity, is the cause for their shortness of breath. And it's not until people start to investigate uh, and notice that the diaphragm is elevated, and it's not just because they're a little obese, it's because the diaphragm's paralyzed when they do a sniff test. And then when um, patients get referred in, you know, they're, they're not given false hope, they're given an optimistic uh, evaluation and we're able to affect a positive change in these patients. And so I think the most important takeaway is, you know, to fully uh, evaluate these patients and not uh, ascribe it to cardiac dysfunction or their obesity, uh, because when it's identified, we are able to uh, have a significant improvement ho however we approach them. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I... I think uh, what we notice amongst the uh, patients that are contacting us is that in some cases there's a tendency to uh, write off the patient and, and say that, you know, traditionally a paralyzed uh, diaphragm, especially unilateral, is well tolerated. Symptoms uh, are mild and it can be, can be lived with. And, uh, you know, we're seeing patients that are suffering, their quality of life is suffering. And as you mentioned, Tom, the... Uh, Sometimes in, in well-conditioned individuals, uh, it, it, the outward appearance may be that they're not uh, suffering too badly. I had a gentleman who was a marathon runner, and he can still run an eight-and-a-half-minute mile, but, you know, he's exhausted in his quality of life. His, his uh, normal baseline is, has been hindered. Um, and so for everybody, it's, it's a change from their baseline, and, and in some cases it's, it's mild, in some cases it's more severe. Um, there was a question is how, how common is phrenic nerve damage and disorders of the diaphragm with Guillain-Barre? Um, we do see it from time to time. Dave, I don't know if you want to comment. Uh, it's not something we see uh, often. And I don't know if it's, uh, if it's related to referral patterns or if it's not as common as maybe we think it is. Obviously, we would expect in patients that have severe Guillain-Barre, there would be some respiratory component. Dave, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, it is something. Can you hear me then? Yes. Uh, it is something you see. Um, usually they respond to IVIG, 
or plasmapheresis and they're weaned from the ventilator. Uh, they occasionally then turn into a chronic inflammatory uh, demyelinating neuropathy. And this can go on for months and years in some cases requiring repeated uh, plasmapheresis or IDIG. Um, so it would be part of a chronic um, uh, condition at that point in time. Right. Um, is there a bedside test that can confirm uh, diaphragm disorders or paralysis? Uh, in general, you know, there's ultrasound, uh, which could be done at the bedside if, uh, obviously, uh, if the patient is, is homebound. Uh, you know, we use uh, chest fluoroscopy uh, x-rays and uh, sniff tests to really confirm the diagnosis. A bedside spirometry would not be as specific, but is something that could be done. Uh, we use uh, maximal inspiratory pressure testing. Uh, I feel that that's uh, been demonstrated in some cases to be more specific for diaphragm paralysis because it's an inspiratory measure. But really, you need the radiographic, you need some kind of radiographic imaging to uh, to really hone in that it is a diaphragm issue. We do see patients that think they have a diaphragm problem and are, they, they meet all the symptomatic requirements, but they don't have the confirmatory imaging, and we, we really do need that. Um, and another question about Guillain-Barre, about the severity of phases of Guillain-Barre. IVIG has not been mentioned to this patient. No, I'm, I'm not, uh, that's as far as my knowledge base in Guillain-Barre, but uh, Dave, you have any other uh, yeah, information I mean, about the severity? Yeah, is, yeah, IVIG is standard treatment right now for uh, GBS, and usually that's given right away after the diagnosis is made clinically, even in the absence of a, um, a spinal tap or EMG, the physicians will jump right on with IDIG with a proper uh, clinical presentation, and they'll often run multiple uh, series of that. All right. Well, I, I'd like to thank the speakers. I'd like to thank you, Tom and, and Dave, for doing this, and uh, thanks for everybody that was um, uh, attending this morning, and you have our contact if anybody wants has additional questions or uh, wants to speak offline. We're happy to uh, address any particulars of patient care or issues related to this topic. Thanks to everybody. Have a good morning. Thank you.